Hello and welcome to my Halloween special. And on this video, I'm going to be going through my 10 favorite horror Halloween themed pieces of music, right? So, um, as you can see, no expense has been spared in bringing you this video today. Well, in fact, um, all the expenses have been spared, uh, except for uh, um, from Tesco's a little makeup um, pack that I went and got, and I've got my torch here. There's my torch. So I'm, I, I'm actually doing the lighting effects as, as we speak. So um, I've got a couple of rules with this playlist, right? So um, I've called it my Halloween playlist. Uh, my 10 favorite scary tunes. I nearly forgot the title of this video. Um, I'm not going to include on here any tunes by Black Sabbath. That's too easy. And I've got to be honest, there's so many incredible Black Sabbath tunes. Originally, I put the tune Black Sabbath at number one, and I thought, well, it's just too easy, so I took it out. There's no Black Sabbath tunes, and um, I, I, I am not going to just be pulling from black metal and death metal and goth music. That would be too easy. I've tried to pull from a whole wide range of styles of music, right? Um, there's nothing from Number the Beast, I am made neither. Nothing at all, right? I haven't picked from that. These are all the easy pickings and of course there's no thriller by Michael Jackson that's not on the list I thought it's so obvious that that would just take up um you know too many spaces and I, I wouldn't be able to get into some of the more weirder choices that I've got into on here um it's not particularly ranked in any order I'm going to go sort of one to ten uh, they're just my favorite horror tunes and also I've tried to really go across the genres with it so we've got stuff from a lot of different places so of course we've got to get them out of the way at number one they're always on a list of mine we've got the mavish Orchestra. i have to have the mavish Orchestra list remember you've got to remember why we're here you know you know I'm, i may look absolutely ridiculous right now but we've got to remember why we're here and it is about the music and i'm hoping beyond how stupid this all really is that you'll actually be entertained by some of these choices and some of the areas we get into so number 10 we've got the mavish Orchestra. the mavish Orchestra for me are an incredibly frightening and scary and dark band. I think um, for all that sort of elevated spirituality that John McGoughlin tries to put across in that band, there's something absolutely terrifying about them. And no more so than on the san song Sanctuary off uh, Birds of Fire, which is a dark and menacing um, brooding piece of music. Um, if you look down below in the links, you will see I've created a playlist of the, of the songs I'm choosing today. And um, if you stick that on and listen to it, that will be sort of my instrumental opener to set the dark, menacing, frightening mood for this playlist. Um, I think one of the things with John McGoughlin that's really interesting is as he progressed, um, that darkness, which I think is something that we really love about the Mavish Doc, just slowly diminishes from his music. He can see it slowly draining away. By the time he gets to um, the end of the Mavish Nocturne and Shakti, it's almost like there's been a transformation in him. And from that moment on, his music is a complete opposite. It's very light. It's, 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 it's very um, airy. And that darkness seems to go as though something in McGoughlin went. I've spoken to many Mavish Nocturne fans about this and they all feel the same way. You know, that there's, a, there's, a, um, you, there's something that goes later on. But on Sanctuary, it's there in full blast. Slow, menacing, dark and frightening. It's got perhaps the most scariest Moog solo by Jan Hammer. Absolutely incredible. He just re really rips the emotions. So that's what I've, I've got um, on that is that number one, we have Sanctuary. Well, the Mavish structure. The next track up is Get Out of My House by Kate Bush. Um, so many people who watch this channel love Kate Bush. I absolutely love Kate Bush. There's a number of tunes that we could have picked for this you know, list. I nearly went for Hammer Horror. But on Get Out of My House, which is off the Dreaming album, Kate not only goes into a terrifying space on that track, but absolutely possibly one of the most absurd places where Kate imagines herself as a poltergeist in a house she basically turns um the scenario around that rather than seeing it from the people who are being haunted point of view 
on that song she sees it from sees it from the haunters right um and amongst the screams of get out of my house as as this ghost tries to evict in sort of um beetlejuice fashion these people from the house she then starts to emulate the sound of a donkey and I've always felt this is one of those moments in Kate Bush's catalogues where she's just so further out. For, for a mainstream art, artist that has like chart success, you know, uh, sells records, this is like um, perhaps her most out there moment on any album whatsoever. An absolute incredible moment. Um, there's other tracks I'm thinking of Waking the Witch off um, The Hounds of Love. I'm th thinking of the. Um, there's a, a song, very strange song, which I think is called The Infant's Kiss, which is about a child that's um, possessed by a sort of sexualized evil spirit. That's another strange song. So we really could have done this video probably out of Kate Bush, Kate Bush tune. She really does, you know, <laughs> go to some dark places. So that's what I got at number two. All right, and number three. I felt I needed to represent all that goth stuff, you know. Um, me being my dad, I'm 54, so I, I was sort of traversing my way into music in the early 1980s. And of course, you had all the guys, kids that were into pop music, you know, Culture Club and all that lot of stuff. And then under the surface, you had all those people that were into Sisters of Mercy and, you know, and all that type of stuff. Uh, the Cure. And that was all pretty dark and scary. Uh, and I felt I need to represent that on the list. I've always had a love-hate relationship with that genre. It always seems a bit like um, heavy metal for middle-class kids to me. And uh, I would m much have rather rocked out to the frightening sounds of Iron Maiden. Um, but I think in terms of gothic, you know, true gothic rock, and you've got to remember that goth rock morphs slowly into what we call emo. It sort of back ends itself back into metal and rock anyway. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm scratching. I can't scratch with all this on my face. Um, I've got makeup on, if you didn't know. It. I'm, not, I'm not just uh, having a particularly bad day. Uh, some of you may not have noticed that I've actually sort of tried to make myself look, myself look horrific. Um, or, shall we say, more horrific. Um, but this sort of um, thing I've tried to get here, well, my, my kids have done this, actually, um, to try and get this sort of cheek bony look. Um, that, of course... Um, was embodied so great by a gothic band called Bauhaus. And Bauhaus made a song called Bella Lugosi's Dead, which is about as terrifying as you get, you know. Um, I, I did a little bit of research for this and I, and I decided to watch that again and I watched the video for it, but there's some incredible footage of Bauhaus performing um, Bella Lugosi's Dead on top of the pops, um, which... Uh, mainly consists of the lead singer in a similar makeup look as me sitting in a sort of dark throne right on the state on the top of the pop stage whilst this sort of industrial clanking sort of horror torture chamber sounds go on for about two minutes i i think that bella lugosi's dead has got to be on the list of one of the most bizarre tunes to actually get in the charts absolutely strange it's it, it's it's up it's up there with Pig Bag, which is a, a a band that had a number one in the eighties, which you know was basically almost like disco free jazz. I always thought that was a strange record as well. And so is Bella Lugosi's Dead. You know, um, I could do a video, I think, on you know bizarre stuff that got in the charts. I think that's actually not a bad idea. And Bella Lugosi's Dead would be on that list as well. Um, I think in the UK we all remember, and I wish I could remember the lead singer of uh, Bauhaus, but uh, as you know, my jazz fusion prognology is, is okay. But there's no way I'm going to remember that guy. Um, I, sh I, do, I do know it. It's, it's not there. Peter Murphy. Is that the guy? Is it in there? I did I manage to pull that out? The same guy that couldn't remember the, lead, the keyboardist of <laughs> Genesis? <laughs> right, so is it Peter Murphy? We'll soon find out. You'll tell me in the comments. Uh, but he also, um, there was an advert for cassette tape Maxell that he was in. So they, they, had a, they, they had a quite a cultural crossover bows, but they were pretty out there. So that's what I've got anyway at number three. Right, now number four, I'm back more on, on home territory because at number four, I've decided to put One More Red Nightmare um, by King Crimson. King Crimson also a peddler's 
of the dark, um, the, of the satanic, of Beelzebub. I always felt that King Crimson's got aspects of that in their music, right from that opener on the first album, 21st Century Schizoid Man. But um, where, what do we pick from? Well, the reason I went for one, red, one more Red Nightmare is because I think, you know, Red is one of the great albums they make. Many people think it is the greatest album they make. And of course, it's, it's about a nightmare. You know, so actually in the lyrics, we're referring to horrific stuff. Um, it's also famous for the bizarre cymbal sound, cymbal sound that Bill Bruford gets on that track. Um, in 2005, I was playing at a drum festival and Bill Bruford was at that festival and I managed to um, sit down and chat to him for quite a while. And I said, can you please tell me the story of the symbol on One More Red Nightmare. And he said, when they arrived at the studio, there'd been a band in there already. And obviously one of their um, symbols had basically collapsed. It, it hadn't broken as such. It wasn't cracked, I don't think, from what Bill said. It was more, it just collapsed in on itself and someone had thrown it in the bin. And Bill Bruford being Bill Bruford, with his exploratory mind and, and want for new sounds, fishes this out the bin and he said it looked like a sombrero. Now, um, there's a really trendy thing going around. If you watch any cool sort of drummer that's playing on that sort of, you know, neo-soul, you know, modern funk approach, I'm thinking of people like Chris Daddy Dave, they now have that curvy floppy um, symbol that looks like a sombrero, you know. <laughs> so I think whatever Bill discovered there has now become de rigueur for any super cool drummer nowadays. I want to get one. I haven't got one of those symbols. I'd love to get one. You know, um, I always thought used to do it by just finding a couple of old beaten up symbols and sticking them on top of each other until I got a sound I liked. But yeah, that symbol sound really, um, you know, makes that track. Of course, Red has this incredibly heavy, dark sound to it. And, uh, and I don't know how many people know this, but um, Red was actually a big influence on Kurt Cobain and the sound of Nirvana. So um, it's talked about this album so many times on that channel, but there, that's what I've got at number four, is King Crimson with One More Red Nightmare. So what have we got next? Number five. Well, I have been considering um, making a video where I do my 10 favorite songs of all time. And this is definitely a contender for that. This is possibly the best song on here. It's an absolute cracker. And it's Ghosts by Japan, um, which is off the album that they made where David Silbian is eating this sort of Chinese food or Japanese food in a sort of Japanese setting. And I'm stalling for time because I'm trying to remember what that album is called. <laughs> And I can't, but I'm sure you'll put it in the comments. It's it's pretty much the last Japan album that came out. Japan sort of emerged as a sort of post-Roxy music art pop band. But as they move on, they take sort of Eno-esque influences, progressive rock influences, electronica influences. Um, and by the time you get to the last album, you've got quite a virtuoso sort of proggy, uh, avant-garde prog album, you know. I've argued it elsewhere that Japan by this point are a major influence on the sort of prog scene that's going to emerge much later on, really around, you know, bands like Steve Wilson and Porcupine Tree. Um, and I'm trying still, I was hoping I could remember the name of that Japan album. It's, it's not, it's not Still Life or something. I can't remember it. Anyway, it's, it is, it's a fantastic album. Now, Ghosts, it's pretty much unlike everything else on that album. The rest of the album is sort of bubbling, Eno-esque funk with Mick Khan's incredible bass lines and, you know, and Steve Johnson's like ridiculous sort of, you know, sounds almost like program drums, very detailed sort of Steve Gadd meets Kraftwerk sound. And there's a definite sound on, on that, that album. Ghosts is different and Ghosts is basically this sort of quiet atmospheric song which is where they're not playing the normal instruments they play they're playing synthesizers i think there's a marimba on there it's very delicately arranged and um there's so much space in it it sounds like 
uh, David Silver has written actually a very strong song with acoustic guitar, um, simple chord progressions, great hooks, and then they've gone, up, gone away with the chord structure, allowing just the melody to breathe and then brought in all these colors which do have a really, really spooky atmosphere. I do think it's one of the greatest songs ever written. And it's the coming together of a fantastic song and a fantastic musical process. Um, it's out and out prog. It was a huge hit here in the UK. I don't know if it was a hit in, the, in America. Um, and again, this is one of those songs that you cannot believe got in the charts back in whenever it was, 1982 or when it, 81 when it came out. Absolutely incredible song, one of my favourite songs. And um, I would go ferreting around in the background to find the name of the album that it's on. But of course, I can't because all the spiders have got me. Look at this spider there, can you see him? Right, I don't like spiders much, you know, but these are um, guarding the treasured albums at the moment, all right? So uh, I have to talk a little bit quietly. I don't want to upset them. Never upset the spiders. Right, so what have I got at number six? Uh, number six, I have got, and I thought, I, I really need, I need something fusion-y on this list because that's what everybody loves. And you know, you try and think of a fusion track, which is, is horrific, um, without going down the sort of Fusac route. You know, I'm, I'm, I know there's, there's, there's a, quite a lot on GRP that is pretty horrific, isn't there? You know, um, of course, there's a terrified Dave Gruesome, you know, with his, his, his awful, you know, 80s TV theme albums. But uh, it's really hard to get a seriously frightening track. And this is this track's not frightening. It's actually very funny. But um, and it, I don't even know whether it's fusion, is it prog? But anyway, I'll get on with it. And number six, I've got Zombie Wolf by Frank Zappa, which is off the album Overnight Sensation. You know, Overnight Sensation is where um, Frank Zappa decided to um, go a little bit funky, I think. He pulled in George Duke. Um, he up, you know, it, it, it's a very funky album, a very jazzy album, very fusion-y album. It's, it's like somewhere between the Mavish Nuxtra, um you know, Stevie Wonder and um, Stravinsky. That's what that album sounds like. And it was a big seller um, for... Um, uh, for Frank, you know, it's got um, a whole host of, like, it's, it's got I'm the Slimes on there, Dirty Loves on there, Dynamo Hums on there. But my favourite track on that album is Zombie Wolf, which is the story of a sort of um, sexual predatory werewolf. You know, the world really needs at least one song about that. There's a cracking guitar solo in there from Frank. Uh, which really, really burns. Um, and of course, that album is famous for having the Iquettes uh, um, with Tina Turner on backing vocals. The story goes, and I will relay it here because it's as good a place to relate as anywhere else, is that Frank was in the studio next door was Ike Turner and the Iquettes and um, he needs some backing vocals. So he said to Ike, can I borrow your backing singers and your singer, which of course is Tina Turner. Um, and I turned around and said, "Yeah, but you're not, you're not, you can't credit them, and you can't play the, pay them more than twenty five dollars." Uh, now Frank got around this by, I think, deliberately misinterpreting that command, um, and he um, he uh, paid them, I think, twenty five dollars an hour each. You know, so they 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 got paid. They weren't credited, but since then it's come out that um, Tina Turner is on that album so when you listen to zombie wolf and hear that incredible you know it's i think it's the middle section that's tina turner singing um she of course does or they they do that incredible vocal on montana which just shows you the virtuosity of those singers to be able to pull that off apparently tina was so pleased that she'd be able to make sing this almost impossible vocal part on montana that she called um, Ike Turner in and he uh, just said, you know, what is this? I think with like swearing and all that. Um, a few years ago, I actually got approached by the drummer of um, Ike Turner's band when he was still alive. And he, he was, a, I think he was a bit of a prog fan. And he asked me to go and, and meet the band. And I, in the end, I turned it down because of course, Ike Turner's reputation go went before him. <laughs> Tried to just get a little bit scary then. Using Ike Turner to get scary. Yeah. So anyway, that's what I've got. Number six is Zombie Wolf 
by Frank Zappa. At number seven, some scary prog, right? At number seven, I have Witch Hunt by Rush. What a tune, right? And I put it on again to listen again. And they really do, you know, cook up a dark, gothy brew at the beginning of that track. Of course, there's always a deeper motive um, with uh, with Rush because the song is really a metaphor for, um, you know, modern day witch hunts, uh, which I think in today's climate is quite apt. This song has probably got more relevance um now than it did then, or, it's, or perhaps that's, it's always been the case, you know, that there are the powers that be that want to be able to control what people think and what people say. And that's what that song's about. But it tells the story of, you know, a, a sort of medieval um, witch hunt, you know. Um, I just love the opening where you sort of have that sort of the bell tolling and you have almost like a musical box sound. You can hear the crowd you know, with their, you know, pitchforks and flaming torches, you know, you could almost feel th that growing, you know, this sort of discontent and the want to go out and cause some damage for somebody, for some perceived sl moral slight that they feel they are in their rights to um, do something about, you know, incredible piece of music. Uh, of course, from an almost nearly perfect album, which is a uh, moving pictures um, by... Rush, so that's what I've got at number seven. Right. Okay, um, I've now got... <laughs> I've gone wrong again. This seems to be the case, right? Hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, I have only got nine here. <laughs> I've got nine choices. So at the end, I'm going to have to pull one out of the ether, which I'm going to do through contacting the spirits of the dead. It's the only way I'm going to be able to do it. So at number nine, I really want to do, you know, um, represent metal. You got Black Sabbath, you've got Iron Maiden, you've got all those black metal bands, you know. Um, you think of Master of Puppets and the cover of that and how frightening that is. Every metal band has gone down the horror route, right? So I thought, what am I going to get? Now, um, the first time I've ever heard that, before I even heard Black Sabbath, was when I was a very young new wave of British heavy metal fan. And I went out and bought Metal for Mothers. How many of you out there remember the, those two albums? Metal for, metal for Mothers Volume 1 and Metal for Mothers Volume 2. You know, that and listening to Tommy Vance on the Friday Rock Show on a, on a Friday night. You, you know, if you, if you want to all know about that scene... Go and have a listen to the song Denim and Leather by Saxon because it just is a beautiful tribute to us very young, short-haired, naive, new wave of British heavy metal fans that had merged in the early 80s. And um, on the Metal for Mothers, by far my favourite tune on that album was Baphomet by Angel Witch. This is an incredible track. It starts off in some bizarre odd, odd time signature. I was when I went up the shop to buy all the the makeup, you know, to buy the makeup and the spiders earlier on. I was trying to work it out. I think it's eleven. It's either eleven or twelve. I can't what can't right quite recall it. But it starts off with this sort of almost like prog metal sound. It's churning and it's dark. You've got all these sort of creepy atmospheric guitar sounds and squeals and honks at the beginning. This is really the sort of beginning of the next level of sort of thrash metal, black metal, dark metal. You know, this is where um, Venom and Ant then going to come in and be so important in the develop that development of that sound. You see, I'm, I'm really getting, as I'm talking about Angel Witch, I'm really getting really frightening in here with the lighting effect. I haven't, I haven't diminished here. I'm, I'm still... I'm still here with the lights. So yeah, that's what I've got at number nine. I wish I could tell you loads more about Angel Witch. I was a big fan of them in the the early 1980s. They were one of those formative bands. I then got into Venom after that and, uh, you know, I was away, you know. Um, but I sort of went then backwards. towards sort of, you know, Black Sabbath and then Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, yes, Genesis. And that, that was my routine. But um, to this day, I absolutely love it. It's, it's the definitive 
metal track this is so much modern metal is so neat and tidy with some pretty boys with their pro tools putting all their bass drums perfectly in time but what you hear with angel which is three scary guys in the recording studio making that sound if only we could go back to that with heavy metal maybe that would save the day but I, that's another video right so i'm now at number nine and i wanted to put something funky on here and i I went trawling through a whole bunch of sort of Parliament Funkadelic albums, trying to find something, and and there's that sort of science fictiony, you know, slightly slightly hor horrific. You got the Brides of Doctor Funkenstein, and uh, I nearly put that on, but then I thought, um, and this isn't really funk. Is this soul? I don't know. Is it even blues? But I absolutely love this tune, and I'm going to put it on the list at number nine, and that's I put a spell on you by Screaming Jay Hawkins. Now, this song, ostensibly, if you listen to the lyrics, is, is, is just a song about love, basically. It's about, you know, casting a love spell on somebody. Um, what Screaming Jay Hawkins does with his songs is he turns it into something extremely exotic, which has a sort of witch doctor aspect. Which, you know, Scream Jay Hawkins has such an incredible voice, such an incredible image as a performer, right? And I think he did this incredible definitive version of this tune. Of course, then along comes the incredible Nina Simone, who is a genius. And she does a version of it, which I think has become the definitive version, which she winds into this, this um, sort of, it's like a lament. It's, it's so full of emotion. This is what Nina Simone did with so many cover versions. She, she managed to find this meaning in there, which I think for many more people say, well, they, she found this alternative meaning. But actually, I think the most bizarre take on this is, is the version by Screaming Jay Hawkins, um, which I've got at number nine on the list. And so um, nearly at the end of the video, I need a tenth one. Right, so um, I haven't got one. I'm gonna to have to pull one out of my mind now. This is where I go all abstract. So if we could just contact the dead, if you could all, if we could just put our hands on the table and touch fingers and close our eyes and ask, is there anybody out there? If there is somebody out there, could you knock twice? <coughs> oh, there is, I think I've contacted somebody. We've got somebody. Are you a friend or foe? Are you a friend? <coughs> Was, did I say two knocks for yes? I'm, I'm assuming two knocks for yes. Let's go with that. Oh, you're a friend. Are you a fan of jazz fusion? <coughs> Why is that? Is it because you didn't like the way it just was a shallow display of virtuosity um, which diminished the original talents of the people involved and then just got subsumed into sort of a commercial um, chase to try and get hit records with cheap disco beats and shallow overdub soloing. Is that, is that why you don't like the jazz fusion? Oh, that's good. Yeah. So, are you a prog fan? Oh, we know where we are now. We know where we are. You're a prog fan. That's very good. So... Um, what is your favourite prog band? Is it Genesis? Oh no, Doctor, not, not a Genesis fan. Is it? Um, yes. It's not a yes fan. It's not a yes fan. Right. Is it Emerson, Lake and Palmer? Oh my God, I've got a lot of bands. Ghost, you've got to realise I've got a lot of bands to get through. Um, oh, what? Oh. There's only, if we've contacted the dead and this is a spirit, there is only one band it can be. Are you a Van de Graaff Generator fan? <laughs> oh, I, I knew it. I knew it. Right. So which of the Van de Graaff Generator songs is are you going to put in for your top 10, you know, um, horrific soundtracks? Now, this is going to be terribly really hard because I don't know much about Van de Graaff Generator. You know, I did a little bit of research um, and I, and it, 
<laughs> I've got to come up with a name. I, any any Van de Graaff generator song at this point would be would be great. Um, so I, I'm not going to choose one at number ten. Right, I'm going to leave it empty. It's going to be a question mark, right? But I want because I I I I know there's a ton of Van de Graaff generator fans out there and I know they're pretty horrific and we can include Peter Ham and all that so can you in the comments below put in the number 10 for me that I've missed off and once I will decide which my favorite one is I will announce it here and I will add it to the playlist which is down below it, it does that sound all right ghost does that sound like a good plan very good are you going to go away now Really good. Go on then. Brilliant. So I've got to the end of my Halloween special. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I am um, now going to try and wash my face because I've got to go and because uh, this is makeup. You might have thought that I, you know, that this was really horrific. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it is really horrific. Right. So um, anyway, if you like this video, then please like. And if you want to see more stuff like this, you can subscribe. Whether you will see stuff like this again, I don't know. I th my channel seems to be getting sillier and sillier, and uh, I like it. So, and if you want to support me, because obviously this all costs money. Fake spiders, cobwebs, sound effects, makeup. It all costs money, you know. So if, um, if, you, if you want to support me, then uh, you could become a Patreon and... Uh, don't forget to put your number 10 in there because I've messed up here and I've only done nine. There's always a mistake on my channel. It's becoming a little, it's, it's becoming a, a little bit of a thing now. So I'm, I'm gonna try and do something frightening at the end now with this light. So I'm gonna sort of come into the camera, right, like this. I'm gonna bring the torch up to my face, right, causing all sorts of something. And then there, there we, we go. go. We'll, we'll see, see you on the, the next video. video.